All right, what's up, everybody? Episode 434 of the podcast, talking a little MMA. It's been a bit since we covered the UFC and talk MMA. It's been a, it's been a, at least a month. I think we covered 279, right? <clears throat> but um, yeah, we're gonna be talking UFC 281 in this episode. So I hope you guys enjoy it. Nice to get a little break from the Knicks. Uh, I certainly need it right now. Uh, though we go right back out there tomorrow night. Um, but UFC 281 took place this past weekend. It is currently Monday, November 14th as I'm recording. Um, so we're going to talk about it. Talk about Saturday night. And I hope you guys enjoy the show. Let's get into it. Welcome to BD4. An RJ Carbone podcast. BD4, where there is no better way to get your Yankees and Knicks analysis. We also do MMA. Yanks every series, Knicks every game, MMA on occasion. BD4 is a five-star show on Apple Podcasts, also available in video format on YouTube and Spotify. So thanks for stopping by, and we hope you enjoy the show. Champion of the world! Anthony for three. Bang! That one goes down and the game is tied. Time! Time! Penetrate, create, and showing some dexterity as well with the left hand. Oh, 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 oh. Yankees win! All right. What's up, everyone? How we doing? Welcome to the show. Welcome to the podcast. Welcome to BD4, where there's no better way to get your Yankees and Knicks analysis. We also do MMA now, too. Yanks every series, Knicks every game, MMA on occasion. And this is one of those occasions. Big pay-per-view this past weekend that we're going to discuss. Um, So welcome to the show. I am your host, RJ. Um, yeah, Monday, November 14th, as I am recording, and it should be, at the very latest, Tuesday, the 15th, when you get this episode. I'll probably drop it late tonight, though. This weekend was fun, man. Fun UFC event. Um, and then Sunday, listen, I gotta talk about this, because this is a show that everybody needs to watch. Before we even dive into the UFC, and you can go down below if you're on YouTube and click on the timestamps, I don't give a shit. But I want to discuss one of my favorite TV shows, uh, maybe ever. Did anybody else see the premiere of Yellowstone Season 5 last night? So good, man. It's it's my favorite show right now. Um, it's crazy how time flies because I would just I remember watching season four and setting it up on the big screen down here in the studio, having to buy Fubo TV so I can get it down here, and then uh, kind of being like so so about the season at the end of it. But I'm hyped up for this season. I think it got off to a good start. Um, it took place, I would say it's about eight or so months later, judging by the way Monica looks, she's full blown pregnant. I think she's about, they said in the show, like three weeks before she's due. So it takes place about eight or so months later. Um, you see John Dutton wins the election. I guess we're going to do this recap. (laughs) I wasn't planning on it, but I want to talk about it. He wins the election, becomes governor of Montana. You know, he get, we see it starts off, he's waiting in the office, wherever. He gets the phone call from his opponent, Scott something. Congratulates him. He's watching Scott then make his concession speech. Then John makes his speech. Um, one of my favorite lines in it is, I'm the opposite of progress. I'm the wall that stops it. I just... I wonder which party he supports. <laughs> Um, yeah, they hold the party for him 
And you could tell John wants nothing to do with it. He wants nothing to do with politics, nothing to do with being the governor. And he says that too. He makes it clear, you know, for I got to spend four years in this office. He'd rather be on horseback and you know, leaning over fences and t- and shooting the shit with uh, Rip. But he won, and um, he obviously only did it so he could keep the ranch. That's why ranch safe from the market equities people um so they don't build an airport on the ranch and a bathroom (laughs) as as, um whatever her name was told beth uh you want to keep it safe from the native american dude what's his name rainwater thomas thomas rainwater i think um and his sidekick guy mo you know they want to build a hotel and casino he just wants to on this damn thing and I think it's my favorite part when he's you know John wins and he's announcing that he's going to ignore all the bullshit stop the building the rezoning as well and and just seeing the reactions from like that Markwood Equities person Caroline seeing her flip out and throw her shit literally throw shit out the out the fucking uh, at the windows and just start cussing up a storm. And then the other chick who's been in Thomas Rainwater's ear this entire time, she's angry, the ugly one. But yeah, I mean, the conflict is, is, you know, he's supposed to play the game as, uh, Linnell tells him. And he, he's supposed to be more of a politician than a leader at times. And obviously John doesn't want to be into all this. And, you know, she's telling him in order to get favors, to make this process um, to keep the ranch safer, he's got to give favors first. You know, but he just cuts right to it and, you know, breaches all these contracts and now he's in jeopardy of being sued. And so that whole thing seems like it's going to be the main plot line for the season. That's it's going to be interesting. And, you know, they have a new antagonist who is very Beth like. She's fiery, aggressive. She's kind of got that alpha mentality. Um, she's like Sarah Atwood, and she's working with the Marquardt Equities people as they, quote, take the gloves off now. Um, yeah, it, it's going to be good. That's my quick recap. I just love, you know, every time Jamie's in a scene, I keep laughing because of how much of a beta they're making him. <laughs> just nodding his head and, and getting bullied and the whole scene with Beth she's like say yes ma'am and he's like yes ma'am <laughs> shows him how to shut the door like a man it's he is being made a bitch by this family um, but some other storylines to follow should be interesting uh, with Casey you know, he's not just sitting around and meditating or whatever the fuck he was doing talking to wolves he was chasing around horse thieves the first scene we see him at the border and he's arguing with, you know, the Canadian officers about jurisdiction. Uh, but his and Monica's storyline is is uh, one that's... that's. I just get these vibes that it's not going to last. That something's going to go wrong. The whole vision thing with the wolf telling Casey last season that it's going to end bad. And just bad stuff keeps happening to that family. Like, Monica gets into a car crash as she's driving to the hospital. And her kid, Tate, who got older, is in the shotgun seat. She ends up losing the baby that she's pregnant with. So, just seems like the the background music is always, like, very... What's the word? It's not happy. (laughs) Whenever they're in scenes together. It just seems like... They're setting us up for something there. Um, scenes I do love are the bunkhouse scenes, of course. Love those guys. It, they're It's always fun when they get screen time and they're shooting the shit in the bunkhouse and they're doing their things. They're bantering and all that. Uh, we might have a new love story going, developing here with uh, Ryan and that chick. Um... Seems like he was focused on a lot, a lot last night, Ryan, and he might get some more lines this year because he had the whole wolf scene between him and Colby at the end of episode two, um, or the second part, whatever you want to call it. 
uh, you know, when he was shooting the, they were shooting the wolves to find out how that, uh, was it a cow or a fucking buffalo, or whatever it was, um, to stop them from eating that dead buffalo, whatever the fuck it was. Was it a cow? But, you know, they were shooting wolves, and then they found out that the two wolves they shot had GPS beacons on them. Collars. So, it's obviously property of some important officials, and that, that's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. Um, they call Rip to help them, and you know, they strap the collars to driftwood. They just slip it down a piece of driftwood. Um, but as the camera shows at the end of the episode, one of the one of the driftwood logs gets stuck in the creek as as they're flowing in the creek because the collars that were on the wolves were tracking collars. If they are not moving for more than twelve hours, it sends a distress signal, and so they did a whole thing so they could keep the logs moving in the creek. So they threw them on a piece of driftwood, they threw it in the creek to keep the logs moving and made it look like the wolves were alive and just walking so they wouldn't alert the authorities, whoever. And one of the piece, the logs of driftwood got caught in the creek on a branch. So that obviously stopped the tracker. It's just sitting there idle. So that's going to lead to something, obviously. Because um, if they get caught with that, that's prison time. Uh, at least a decade. So... You had, you know, the Rip and, and Beth storyline continuing. Beth apologizing for her past and showed some flashbacks of, of what happened on their first date. Um, and then Rep apologizing, telling, you know, did I say Rep? Beth apologizing and, um, you know, they not much with them this episode, but you had Rip telling Beth at the party that he doesn't think this ranch is going to last while everybody else is having a good time enjoying it, he's kind of just laying down on a hill watching the entire thing. And he's been thinking a few negative thoughts throughout the episode. Um, and that their, their, their stepson, whatever the fuck we're going to call him, Carter, that kid is also older. I mean, he looks completely different. But yeah, it was a good show. A lot of flashback scenes. Um, Rip looks very much like a younger version of Rip. thought they did well on Beth too uh, John obviously we've seen a few of him already uh, what's his name Lloyd character Lloyd his younger character is actually his son playing him so that was pretty cool to see the younger flashback but yeah it was good and I'm also excited to uh, see how this 1923 show is uh, I think that's late December but that's going to be awesome Harrison Ford is starring in that one they have great casting. This show, this whole universe that has become, has got great casting. Um, so I think they're, what they're going to do is, it's a 14 season, 14 episode season. So I think they're going seven. Then they're going to play 1923. That'll air. Then they'll do the next seven when that ends. I still have to finish 1883. Um, I think I'm like three episodes behind. So it was good. Uh we're, we're here to talk some UFC, aren't we? Um, so I figured we get to that right now. Uh, let's get to break. When we get back, we'll talk some MMA Saturday. Let's get to it. Hey, guys. So if you are a listener of the podcast often and you want to know where to find me on social media, you can find me on Facebook at BD4. You can find me on Twitter at BD4Pod. And you can also find me on Instagram at Rob J. Carbone. BD4 is located on many different platforms. You can listen to the podcast on Apple Podcasts. And if you do there, be sure to give us a five-star rating and review. You can listen to it on Spotify. But you can also watch the podcast on both Spotify and YouTube. BD4 is available on many other platforms as well. All you got to do is search it up. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and much more. Welcome back to the show. I'm your host, RJ Carbone, and you are listening to episode 434. Uh, that should say up here. Let me change that. 434 of the podcast. Um, there we go. Thanks for stopping by. 
So, where do we start with this one? Well, first off, um, some good and bad news to bring up in the MMA community. <laughs> Obviously, yesterday, I believe it was, Anthony Johnson passed away. Now, I am fairly new to UFC, so I'm not going to say I saw or know anything about Anthony Johnson, I didn't see him fight, never really knew much about him. I've heard of him, maybe, but unfortunate. I don't know what he was battling. I really don't, but I know he was beloved in the community. Um, a guy with some big fights underneath, underneath his belt, I do know that. But, yeah, prayers for his family. Uh, on a positive, Cain Velasquez. Um, this was a little bit farther back. He's free, so that's good news. The whole thing with his kid and him shooting. Yeah, that I don't even want to. But I'm just happy he's free. Um, it's, it's It was a good day finding that out. Uh, very emotional for him, I'm sure. Um, you know, one of the things that caught my attention, I think I was listening to Ariel Hawani's podcast. He was talking about how Cain Velasquez was saying to either him or DC that like, while he was in prison, he realized how much he took for granted outside. Like having as many meals as you want at any time of day, things like that, and be able to walk outside. He says, like, you don't realize that stuff until you're inside. And I can only imagine how much we actually take for granted. That we never really take a step back, put everything down, stop, close our eyes, and think of how fortunate we are. We really don't. We're all so connected and we're so warped to all this technology and everything that we have and all these resources that we never really care to take that step back and think about how fortunate we are. It's crazy. But that's a positive. He's free. Uh, but yeah, Saturday, on the 29th anniversary of the UFC, we got what was my favorite card of the year, far and away. Um, and there were some really good cards this year, but this one was definitely my favorite card of the year. First off, Madison Square Garden, absolutely electric. Um, another one that I tried going to, but once I saw the tickets, nosebleeds north of 500. Thank you. I'm out. Um, but it sounded like it was just nothing but electricity in that building. Um, yeah. It was fun to watch. It was unbelievable. Just excitement all throughout the very, from the very, very, very first early prelim, which ended in a knockout, all the way to the main event, which also ended, as we know, in a knockout. It was a top three card at worst this year, in my opinion. Um, and that's, that's, like I know, because the only reason I say, Top three is because I did miss a few fight night cards. There was one fight night I remember maybe like two months ago. People were absolutely raving about it. Saying it was so good. Um, and I unfortunately missed it. So that's why I'm not... I, I can't say this was the best card of the year. I, it was the one I saw. It was the best card I saw of the year. But it was definitely up there. Um... It was so good. I mean, there were 14 fights, and 12 of them ended in a finish. I want to say three or four subs, and the rest were knockouts. Unbelievable. Um, where do we start? Should we start? I know we usually start at the early prelims, and then we'll work our way up. I think we're going to start. We're going to do it reverse this time. We're going to start at the top because I want to get right into that Izzy fight, man. The main event. Championship five-round main event in middleweight. Alex Pereira. That's what I'm going to call him this episode. I know it's like Alex Pereira. I'll try to remember that, but I don't want to just keep flip-flopping. So we'll just go Pereira. He TKOs Israel Adesanya in round five. Um, Izzy fought a great fight. He may have been losing a little bit in the first round. But he eventually stole it at the end when he just rocked the living shit out of Pereira. A few times too. One of them, one of the 
the the punches he landed was after the horn. But I still thought he did he he did plenty enough at the end there hitting those combos to take the first round. The second round I, I think went to Alex. I gave that one to him in a ten nine. The third round, Adesanya Adesanya actually gets his first UFC takedown. And he ended up in top position and had control the entire round. He was pretty dominant. So he took the third. I thought he also took the fourth round. He was pretty great there. And then he was doing such a great job using his length and his speed to take care of Alex exactly how he should have. He was making good counters. And it just seemed like he was gaining steam <clears throat> as he went along. Really. And he, it looked like he just totally took the momentum. And then in the fifth round, he was honestly on his way to, in my opinion, what would would have been a 49-46. Um, but instead, all it took was one right hand by Alex. And then, boom. Alex stung him once. And that he just kept going and kept going and going. And that was it for Izzy. The fight was called. And I I think that's what he should have done earlier, Pereira. It felt like a lot during this fight. Alex was going singles and threw a couple doubles in there. But he never really used those 3-4 combos at the end. Until the end. Um, But when he did, he had Izzy wobbling there. And it paid off. I actually went to my buddy before that round started. And I told him. I said Adesanya is winning. But he's got to be careful. Because he can't let Alex get too close. Because a lot. If you're watching that fight. A lot of the time during the fight. Alex Pereira had Adesanya backing up towards the fence. He had him getting close to the fence. And that's a danger zone. Um, and it's exactly how Alex won. And you heard his corner too. Enter in the fifth round. They were telling him, hey, look, you've lost this fight. They were screaming at him. You're going to have to go for the finish right the fuck now. There's no bullshit and you're going to have to pick up a finish. Not even a 10-8 is going to get you out of this. You have to finish him. And he finished him. Now, was it early stoppage? I don't know. You tell me. I can see why some people think that. You know, Adesanya is the champ. So maybe he should have gotten that leeway. But... He was looking pretty done there, in my opinion. Um, They asked him about it in the press conference. He didn't seem like he was too disappointed that it was called. He was he said that his ego thinks he could have kept going, and he felt like he was okay. And he actually joked about how he, he wished Steve Maserati was still reffing that. <laughs> but, I don't know. It looked to me like Alex had him. Um, and Alex, Alex is a big dude, man. He's scary. He's terrifying and he's huge. So there's really no shame if you're out of Sanya. I mean, your only two losses in your entire MMA career are against guys that are way bigger than you. You know, you had Jan Blahovich, who is an entirely different weight class as he's going up to light heavyweight for that fight or he did rather. And then you just fought Alex Pereira, who's a monster who had a cut weight for this. You know, so I, they, they, let's do the dude fought giants, um, and he looked good in both of those losses. He was on his way to win this fight, and he took Blahovich to five. But how crazy is that, dude? Thinking about it, all in what like a four? Yeah, in August was was when Usman lost. So it's a four month span that Usman, um, Oliveira, and Adesanya. All lose their belts or title fights because obviously Charles with the whole weight cut thing. But yeah, that's pretty cool. That's it's pretty shocking. You know, it goes to show you that in the UFC anything can happen at any moment. And these reigns, not gonna say they're short lived, but they're very difficult to stay in. It's hard to be king in the UFC, um, which makes it all that more impressive when guys defend their belt time after time and double champs and all that stuff. But, um, yeah, the Adesanya fight I thought was good. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see what happens next in that middleweight division. I think you have to go with a rematch. 
you got to see them go at it again. Both of their next fights should be against each other. I think Izzy's earned that right. And I think Pereira, obviously, um, you know, it's time for him to show he can defend it. So at some point next year, that'll be something to look forward to, I think, in the summer, whenever they plan it. Um, I mean, they want, you know, four and a half rounds, so it's, it's going to be some time. The co-main event, Zhang Wei Li submits Carla Esparza in the second round with a, a rear naked choke. Now, I saw the odds on this. They were way in favor of Wei Li. But my buddy, who's not a betting guy, knows nothing about betting, actually goes to me before the fight, and he tells me it is a terrible matchup for Carla Esparza. And he was right. Um, Wei Li is just way too versatile for Carla. And that's exactly what we saw. Carla's just way less dynamic. Um, Wei Li is just so very well-rounded and complete. Right? She's a phenomenal athlete. She's got this great positioning and awareness to her. Great balance on her feet. And just very strong, very quick and savvy. The way she's able to slip in and out of these positions and these locks and chokes on the ground and, and scramble is super impressive, man. Um, and that's eventually how she won. Carla was unable to match Wei Li. You know, if she were to transition out of wrestling, it was difficult for her. Um, she had her moments on the ground, Carla, but, you know, she can't really take down Wei Li like she can any other fighter and, and do damage. So Wei Li eventually takes the belt. She gets her in the hold, in the rear naked choke, and she gets her to tap in the second round. Um, but that division has been fun. And I think it's going to continue to be fun. You know, a lot of a lot of fighters in that division have wore the belt over the last couple of years. You know, between Thug Rose, Carla herself, Yolanda, and obviously Wei Li a few times now. That's been a very competitive weight class, and I think it's going to continue to be very competitive because Thug Rose is going nowhere anytime soon. Um, Wei Li ain't going away, uh, and you hear about. Yolanda recently saying that she's planning to come back and give the fans one more proper goodbye because her retirement kind of came at a surprise. So, yeah, it's going to be an interesting weight class to look at. Um, I know a lot of people give WMMA, as they call it, a lot of shit, but I don't mind it at all. Um, but let's talk about the fight of the night. The fight of the night. Dustin Poirier and Mike Chandler We'll talk about that when we get back from break. Stay with us because we got some things to say. We also have a website now for BD4. If you go to BD4blog.com, you can find the blog, the podcast links, and also where to find me on social media. Just go to BD4blog.com. All right, welcome back to the show. I am your host, RJ Carbone, and you are listening to episode 430 fucking 4 of BD4. Gosh. I'm watching I'm watching uh Home Alone. It's just hilarious. I miss that movie so much, man. <laughs> Getting in the Christmas spirit. All right. Um yeah, that Dustin Dustin Poirier Mike Chandler fight. Fight of the night. It wins fight of the night. Dustin eventually submits Chandler in round three with a rear naked choke. But it was the fight of the night for a reason, man. These two guys, who I respect both of them very much. I'm a big fan of them both. Um, Dustin used to annoy me, but I'm kind of over the Connor thing because I was a big Connor fan. But I'm a fan of both of them, uh, as are most MMA fans. And Yeah, any, any Chandler fight, any Michael Chandler fight is going to be a war. It's going to be fireworks. It's going to be a huge slugfest. A battle. It's going to be a lot of blood. You know, a lot of meat on the ground. <laughs> that sounded weird. But just because of the way he fights, right? He's not exactly the most sophisticated fighter. Not strategic. He, he's a great wrestler too. But he rarely optimizes that part of his skill set. He's always out there, Chandler, just throwing punches, emptying the tank, going for the finish right away. And that's what he was looking like, just going full force, leaving it all out there. 
He just throws. You know, everything he has in him is used all at once because he just throws and he's out there in the first round jumping and throwing punches at the same time. He just unloads. And maybe that's why he's only two and three in the UFC, right? With one of those wins coming against a very declining Tony Ferguson. You know, it's not Bellator. This talent is a lot better. So I think going forward, Mike Chandler might have to be a bit smarter and utilize other aspects of his game. But again, it was a close first round. I had Dustin taken the first round. I think both had each other in trouble at different moments throughout the first round. Chandler gets an early takedown and goes for the choke, but Dustin showed some pretty great defense. And then at the end, you had Dustin doing a little more damage um, before the horn sounded, and and that honestly saved Chandler. Uh, But the second round, Chandler, was he looking tired already? Yeah, but that may have helped him because it kept him more composed, and he played it smart. And he utilized his wrestling. And he took the he took the round. So you're going into round three, one to one in my opinion. And then the the horn sounds, the the round begins, and Chandler just looks completely gassed by the third round. Nothing left in the tank because of that first round where he emptied it all. And then he eventually gets taken down into that rear naked choke and he taps. Um, I don't think he's ever been submitted before, but he was definitely submitted last night. And man, it, it was a fun fight. It was so fun just to watch these two trade trade punches and go to the ground and try different things and chokes on each other there. Um, if you have not seen that fight, don't just watch the highlights. Watch the entire thing to get the full experience. Um, find a way. <laughs> Amazing fight. Um, It's going to be interesting to see what happens going forward. I think Chandler's probably going to drop three or four, maybe more spots. I think he's currently fifth. He might drop. Um, But I I think whether he won this fight or not, his next fight was probably going to be the same thing. I think a lot of people are waiting on it. Uh, He talked about it in the press conference. He's waiting on him to come back and return Conor McGregor. Uh, A lot of people want to see Conor and Chandler go at it, including myself. I think it would be a good match for both of them. Um, We'll have to see what happens sometime next year. Conor Conor just looks jacked. Um, I will say that, but let me look at Chandler. The dude's a physical specimen. There's a reason why he just throws punches because he's got the finishing power. Um, Dustin came in at number two, I believe, on Saturday night behind Charles and, and the champ Islam. So, yeah, it, it was it was fun, dude. I had a very good time watching that fight. I was watching with my buddy down here in the studio. We were just, I was screaming. I was like, yeah, I was just, just so many things happening. It, it was such a high pace, high tempo fight. Goodness. Um, yeah, one of the middle fights on the main card. I don't really want to talk about this because it sucks. It's sad. Frankie Edgar gets knocked out by Chris Gutierrez in the first round. It was rough, man. It's just sad because, you know, Frankie's a legend. New Jersey guy, Tom's River. So I'm a big fan. My uncle who's, you know, who used to live in Tom's River for a long time. He's a big fan of him. But, um, you know, it was Frankie's last fight ever. His family was there. His kids were there. And to see him go out like that, get knocked out cold for a minute there, was tough to see. Um, But, again, it just goes to tell you in in, in the UFC, not everybody's going to have their happy ending. You know, and props to Chris Gutierrez, who handled it with such class afterwards, embracing Frankie Edgar after the fight. You know, he knew who Frankie Edgar was and the status that he holds and what it meant to Frankie to go out on top, but... He went out there and did, he did his job and he, and he handled it humbly. Um, but I wish the best of Frankie. Whatever he's going to do next, I'm sure he'll succeed in because the guy's a winner. Um, over 20-something wins in the in, uh, in MMA. So, yeah. Best of luck to him. Dan Hooker got a TKO last night. He bounced back with a second-round body kick TKO against Poilus. 
I don't know who this Puelas kid is, but I can tell you one thing. It did not look like he's ready for prime time. I mean, he looked terrible up there. The whole time, he's just trying to get Dan Hooker to the ground. He looked scared. He looked uncomfortable as hell. He was on his back like a like a crab. You ever see a crab on their back? They're just wiggling. Maybe he was trying to get a heel hook in there. Trying to be like Islam, but he came out looking like Ryan Hall. <laughs> he looked awful, uh, but Hooker looked good. He kept attacking with front kicks. He was socking him in the mouth a few times, and he eventually got the knockout win with the body kick. I'm happy for Dan, man. It was a much-needed win for him after losing two consecutive, losing in London to Arnold Allen, lost four of his last five. But, you know, he was losing to some tough competition, let's be honest. I mean, this kid was fighting Dustin Poirier. He was fighting Michael Chandler, Islam Makhachev. So he's no slouch. He just had some rough competition, and he bounced back. So good for him. I'm rooting for Dan Hooker. And that was the main card. Uh, we'll talk some prelims, if you want. Uh, the Moicano fight. He defeats Riddell. Moicano looked phenomenal out there on his feet. He controlled the pace. He positioned and ranged, ranged himself very well. And once it went to the ground, Moicano just used his ground game advantage and got the choke. Um... I thought his post-fight Octagon interview was even better, though. He immediately grabs the mic from Joe, doesn't even let Rogan speak, and he just yells, Joe Rogan the God or something. And he's just yelling, Big Apple, Big Apple, just a bunch of screaming up there. And then when he finally lets Joe ask a few questions, um, when he finally asks the patience to let Joe ask some questions, Joe asks him, and then uh, Moicano comes back and he, he doesn't even come close to answering the actual question. He just continues to scream, whatever. But he was out there talking in third person. Moicano wants money. It, it was fantastic. It was absolutely hilarious. Um, and you always get those interviews once in a while. Um, Span defeated Reyes, Reyes with a knockout in the first round. He just completely overmatched him. Just kept rocking him with lefts and rights and just using straight power. Which, um, and, and he was accurate with him, just landing right on his face over and over. And eventually, Reyes just flopped to the canvas, and you got your knockout. Um, Span said this was his first fight that he ever trained for, which was interesting. Um, I don't know where Reyes goes from here, though. He's had it, he's had it rough. Four losses in a row. Uh, John Jones, uh, Jan Blahovich. Yuri, uh, and now Span. So, and he's gotten knocked out in his last three fights. So, could be looking ugly for him. We'll see what Dana does if he keeps him on the roster. Um, oh, how, dude, Aaron Blanchfield. Let me tell you. Now, I I have rooted for Molly McCann, Meatball Molly, Molly Meatball, whatever. Every fight of hers, I, I, you know, I've been a big fan of hers. I love the whole Scouser thing. Her and uh, Patty's got, you know, they've got this duo, this whole shtick. But I was definitely going for Aaron Blanchfield for sure in this fight. Uh, Aaron's one of my favorite prospects. I've been following her for a while. Um, another Jersey fighter from New Jersey. Um, I follow her on Instagram for a bit now, so I, I've been excited since she announced the fight on there. She's she's so dude for for she's twenty three years old by the way, but the way she acts her pers- the, the the persona she carries she's just so stoic and calm out there and fearless and just effort after she won the fight she was just like yeah piece of piece of cake. I mean she's telling us in the post fight that she will be Valentina and that's the confidence you gotta have. And honestly, her ground game is not too far off from Valentina's. But, yeah, she basically just took, from the very get-go of that fight, just took total control and left no doubt um, and got the round one tap. Uh, She went right to the ground and smothered the living shit out of Molly, who was very strong. But 
Aaron's grappling is top notch. I am telling you, she is legitimate. She's going to be elite very soon, and I hope she gets a main event or a co-main event spot on a fight card very soon uh, because she's going to deserve it. She deserves it, man. She's a good fighter, and I don't believe she's lost yet in the UFC, knock on wood, I think 4-0. But I'm a big fan of Aaron, and um, I hope she keeps kicking ass because New Jersey likes to represent. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, a few fights before that, the prelims, Petrosky. That was one of the fights that won to decision. Petrosky beats Terman. Don't remember much. I know in the first round you could have had an argument for Terman taking it. Um, but then rounds two and three left no doubt that it was Petrosky's. Um, after the fight, he calls out Bo Nickel, which the fight I, could, I would like to see. Uh, the Carolina fight, she won. But that was weird because you had the second, like, that last second scorecard change. I've never seen anything like that before. Very sketchy. Um, triggered a lot of MMA fans on the internet, which was funny to me. Who knows what went down? Uh, it looked like, you know, if you like to overreact, it looked like a scripted, like, stage fight. By the way, they, like, just, like, oh, wait, last minute, they're changing it. But, I don't know. Um, but she won that. Carolina did. Um, I hope that's how you pronounce her name. Matt Frivola defeats Azatar in the first round with a knockout. Pretty impressive given that Azatar came into that fight 13-0. and And he gets knocked out in the first round. Um, but he just looked very unsure, uncomfortable out there. And Frivola was just giving him that pressure. Uh, how about Trezano? Is it Mike Trezano? Another East Coaster. I think he's a New York kid. Italian kid. In an absolute war early on. And that could have been the fight of the night too. Had had not the Chandler fight happened. A Poirier Chandler fight. But this was one of the early fights that got the buzz going. That jump started Madison Square Garden. Because these guys were just trading punches. But eventually Trevano, uh, Trezano gets the finish. Um, yeah, it was an excellent card man. I had a lot of fun watching it. I'm excited to see what's next for the UFC. Next week I know we've got... One of my other favorites, uh, Vanessa Demopolopolopolis. The chick that uh, jumped in Rogan's arms. She's got a ton of energy. She's fun, exciting. So she's on that card. Um, I think Derek Lewis is the main event of that card, I think. Or that might be the last fight night of the year. I don't know. i got to check to see who's on the next week's card. But I know Vanessa's on it. Um, yeah, I'm excited. Uh, we're going to get to one more break real briefly. And when we get back from break, we will... Um, Wrap it up with both our parlay and trivia question. Uh, so stay with us. We'll be right back in like 15 seconds. All right, guys. So welcome back to the show. I'm your host, RJ Carbone. You are listening to episode 434 of BD4. Let's talk about our parlay that we placed on Saturday night. All right, let's let's discuss it. Welcome to RJ's Parlay, where my degenerate self breaks down tonight's big parlay. If I miss, it's not surprising. If I hit, I'll probably lose it all the next night, because that's how this works. Welcome to RJ's Parlay. So on Saturday night, this was one of mine. I had a few different parlays, none of them hit, but this was the biggest one I had, odds-wise. I was plus 1,361 odds, plus 1,361, so it was unlikely, but, no, there's no but, I, it was one out of four. <laughs> I hit on Blanchfield money line, but obviously I did not hit the Edgar money line, did not hit the Chandler money line, and I did not hit the Adesanya money line. So, we lose some more 
just got all fucking all we fucking do. Let's wrap it up with the trivia. Let's get to it. It's time! All right. So for this episode 434, our NYY NYK MMA question of the day is. The very first women's fight in UFC history took place at UFC 157 between which two fighters and who won? The very first women's fight in UFC history took place at UFC 157 between which two fighters and who won? All right, so let me know the answer wherever you can reach me. If you get the answer correct, I'll give you a shout out in the next episode. Um, if you don't get it correct, I'll let you know what the answer is in the next show. I'll DM you. Um, but in last episode, 433 or 432. Yeah, this was from episode 432. I forgot to give him a shout out. But Greg from Yankee Crazy Podcast got the answer correct to episode 432. So congrats, Greg. That was on the, um... It's like a, which former Yankee legend was one home run shy from a 40-40 season in 02? Greg gave us the answer, and he was correct. So one last time for this episode, 434, our trivia question of the day. The very first women's fight in UFC history took place at UFC 157 between which two fighters and who won? All right, guys. That's it. I appreciate you stopping by and listening to me ramble for 45 minutes. With that all said, I'll see you in the next show. We'll probably see you tomorrow night when we're talking next. That's always a good time. <laughs> but yeah, great card. I'm excited for the next few cards to wrap up the year. It's going to be cards that I've seen. Um, just hope everybody stays healthy in it. No one uh, gets scratched. All right, guys. I'll see you in the next one. Later. This episode was brought to you by Anchor.